Uh, on behalf of Lumen Christi Institute, uh, welcome to today's talk. I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors, the Catholic Lawyers Guild, the Decalogue Society, the Christian Legal Society, and the Jewish Judges Association, and especially Jenner and Block for hosting us tonight. Tonight, we welcome back Professor Joseph Singer. Uh, he joined us in this very room in 2014, along with Dean Eduardo Penalver, to discuss the topic of Jewish and Catholic approaches to property and social justice, and it was a phenomenal evening, which we hope to uh, revisit tonight. Uh, Judge Singer, uh, Professor Singer's uh, work on judging uh, has been especially interesting to me as a judge for 18 years, and his insights um, seemed very helpful, and I've used them around the country in talking to judges and training judges. And one little paragraph that just was so meaningful for me, and I've used um, in many of those talks, comes from his Normative Methods for Lawyers, an article he wrote uh, a number of years ago, where he says, our best practices in making normative arguments to resolve hard cases is to make assertions that express evaluative judgments about why certain values outweigh other values in particular contexts in light of the appropriate way to understand the meaning of the situation, the events that led up to it, the relations among the parties, and the contours of our way of life. The goal is to show respect for all persons affected by a dispute. And I think in resolving hard cases, there could be no better words to guide a judge in his or her work. Professor Singer is the Bussey Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. He holds a BA from Williams College, an AM in Political Science from Harvard, a JD from Harvard Law School. He teaches about property law, conflict of law, and federal Indian law. He also writes about legal theory with an emphasis on moral and political philosophy. He has published more than 80 law review articles. My three favorite are <laughs> The Rule of Reason in Property Law, UC Davis, Normative Methods for Lawyers, UCIA Law Review, and The Player in the Cards, a 1984 article in the Yale Law Review. He is uh, the ex executive editor of, or one of the executive editors, of the 2012 Cohen's Handbook for, of Federal Indian Law. Additionally, has written a case book and a treatise on property law, as well as no Freedom Without Regulation, The Hidden Lessons of the Subprime Crisis, 2015. My favorite book of his, Entitlement, The Paradoxes of Property, and The Edges of the Field, Lessons on the Obligations of Ownership. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Professor Joseph Singer. Thank you. I want to start by um, thanking the organizations that are sponsoring today, um, and especially uh, Judge Tom Donnelly for inviting me to speak. Um, you know, we law professors have been accused of writing articles that have nothing whatsoever to say to judges. Um, uh, and that may be true f for many people. Um, I admit it. Um, but for my part, I do try to write in ways that could be helpful to judges. I'm especially gratified that it was several of my articles that Judge Donnelly thought were useful to him, um, and imagining that I might have something to say that might be worth hearing. He asked me to focus on a couple of topics that seemed pressing to him. And I teach my students to answer the questions that judges pose to them with no sleight of hand, no evasion, and so I'm going to try and follow my own advice. Yeah. Um, I also tell my students to try and reduce their argument to one sentence. So here's my sentence. Judges make judgments. Now, that either seems so obvious that I should just sit down and stop talking... <laughs> Or it seems terrifying. Um, 
we hear a lot of people saying that judges should be empires that apply the law and they shouldn't make it. And indeed, you know, some judges that I talk to um, tell me that they have no power. The law tells them what to do, and they are just constrained to follow it. Sometimes that's quite comforting, and sometimes they wish they had more discretion to avoid results that they find troubling. But many judges see it as a goal that the law tells them what to do and a reality. I've also talked with judges who don't like it at all when the law makes them make a judgment. I'm an advisor to the uh, American Law Institute that's currently working on the third restatement of conflict of laws. And a third of the advisors are judges, federal and state judges. And every single judge at those meetings um, says they just want rules. They don't want something that says, look at the policies of both states and look at the rights of both parties and then pick the appropriate law based on a number of factors. They don't want that. They just want rules. Um, And in fact, we are giving rules because we've had about 50 years of experience and there are rules that are much better than the first restatement rules that we will be, in fact, um, creating. But we also are going to be asking judges to make judgments based on the interests of the states and the rights of the parties. And the rules have exceptions, and the exceptions are apply the rule unless it's a bad thing to apply the rule. There's, we're not going to save the judges from discretion, even though we're going to have rules. Um, the view that judges don't have any power and they're merely servants of the law is attractive in a lot of ways. It promotes widely shared norms about the value of equality before the law, the importance of precedent, and the democratic importance of uh, deference to elected representatives, lawmakers. It works well if you believe that most cases are easy cases and that hard cases only come once in a while. It works even better if you think that judges have ways of resolving hard cases without making law. But, you know, there's some events in the news, um, and the current fight over the future of the Supreme Court tells us something quite different from that. The court appears divided four to four, and it may soon be divided five four in a particular direction. The justices don't vote based on their political and moral views. Um, They are very strongly constrained by a lot of norms about the role of being a judge. But it's plain as day that their political and moral views are some, have some impact on their decisions. It just is not facing reality to think otherwise. I think what we're talking about is not abstract philosophy, but whether judges have good judgment and what that means. Contested cases involve multiple factors, conflicts among values, and often reasonable competing arguments. Judges are not free and do not feel free to do whatever they want. There are very significant constraints. To me, the strongest constraint on judges is not the rules. Judges know how to escape rules if they want to. They all do. Um, lawyers know how to do that. I think the thing that is most constraining on judges is the duty to give reasons for the decision. And that's what I want to talk about. I think we should be honest about this. When a case is hard, judges have choices. We shouldn't pretend that judges are just doing the math and seeing how it comes out. What we should want from judges is for them to exercise good judgment not to make decisions mechanically and without regard to the consequences of the decisions. I want to explain how easy cases can easily become hard if you look at them closely. Um, And I'll explain why you cannot decide hard cases by applying rules. And then I'll briefly describe a few methods that I think lawyers and judges have to structure debate about 
value choices. Um, in many ways, that one paragraph that Judge Donnelly read is a summary of the talk that I'm giving today as well. That was a good choice. Um, um, how does an easy case become a hard one? So here's one that I've thought about a great deal. I've taught this for 30 years. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title II, has a public accommodation section. And it says that discrimination on the basis of race or religion is prohibited in any place of public accommodation as defined in this section. The section goes on to say each of the following establishments is a place of public accommodation. That sentence is followed by a short list. The list includes hotels, restaurants, entertainment, and sports facilities, and gas stations. The question is this. Does the statute prohibit racial discrimination in retail stores? Seems like an easy case, right? Only a couple of courts have addressed this question. That's kind of an extraordinary fact. There's only two or three courts that have ever addressed that question. And they said the answer is no. The text puts duties on public accommodations as defined in this section. And then it gives a list of the covered entities. It doesn't say definition section. It just has a list. Each of these is a place of public accommodation. It seems like stores are not on the list. The case is over. Here's why I think the case is hard. First, Congress knows how to write a law that makes a list exclusive. There's language you can use. It's not that hard to put it in. If you want to make it absolutely clear that a list is exclusive, we know how to write that. They didn't do it. Second, the places that were listed were the ones where discrimination was most severe. And there were the places that um, uh, had the most segregation and also um, outright exclusion. The list could have been there to remove any doubt that those places were covered and that they were public rather than private. So the language could be there to respond to a social problem and make quite clear that those places are meant to be within the scope of the statute. Third, legislatures often deliberately make statutes ambiguous. To get the statute passed, statutes are compromises. There may have been no majority in Congress for a longer list but also no majority to make the list exhaustive. Congress often does this. When they pass statutes, they often don't say whether the law is retroactive or not. The judges have to figure that out. Um, let, Congress knows that the first question that comes up is, is the statute retroactive? Some statutes answer that question. A lot of them don't. And they don't because it, that often poses conflicts of values that judge, that it's very hard to get agreement about in the legislature. Because Congress knows how to make a law exhaustive and they didn't do it, this is either a very badly written law or Congress deliberately handed the issue to the courts. In either case, the courts have to decide what to do. So the question is this, should you read a civil rights statute narrowly or broadly? and specifically a public accommodations law. That requires knowing something about why we have the law in the first place and what its function was in our history. We might read the statute narrowly because stores are not on the list and Congress maybe didn't want to cover them. Or we could focus on the language that says any place of public accommodation. The word any, the word any doesn't have to be there. Right. Um, I think a ruling that retail stores are perfectly free to engage in racial discrimination would be seen by the general public with a great deal of surprise and probably dismay. I think it would be unjust under current standards and inconsistent with evolving statutory values. The most recent federal public accommodations law is the Americans with Disabilities Act, passed in 1990. 
supported by both Democrats and Republicans. That statute has a quite long list of public accommodations. It includes retail stores. It includes lawyers, um, law firms, and um, doctor's offices, universities, insurance companies. Very long list. If you look at the laws of the states, 46 states have state laws that regulate public accommodations. Stores are covered by every single one of those laws. It's clear that the overwhelming consensus of lawmakers is that retail stores have no right to discriminate based on race. I think if you ask someone on the street, do retail stores have the legal right to discriminate on the basis of race, I think people would say no. I think they'd be quite surprised to find out that the answer is yes. But there are five states that have no state laws that prohibit discrimination in retail stores. Thankfully, Illinois is not one of them. But the states of Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas have no state statutes regulating racial discrimination in public accommodations. So think about that. Should a judge today in 2018 issue a ruling that racial discrimination is perfectly lawful in those states? when the federal statute doesn't say that in plain and unambiguous language. Now, I could be wrong. I could have colleagues or judges who could read this and say, what are you talking about? The statute is plain and unambiguous. There's a list that's not covered. I'm motivated to find it to be ambiguous. And my motivations come from a sense of justice, a sense of history, and a sense of what our current values are, and the whole of our legal tradition. If a judge were to rule that the statute covers retail stores, would Congress immediately have an outcry and want to overturn that decision? I think the answer to that question is no. But if a judge were to rule that it's perfectly lawful for retail stores in Texas to discriminate on the basis of race, if Congress could ever get over its partisan gridlock, it's at least possible that they would be interested in overturning that decision. So I think the case is hard rather than easy. I'm motivated to see the statute is unclear. And I'm not asking you to agree with me about my view that a judge should hold that retail stores are covered. What I am trying to explain is why I consider the case hard rather than easy. I think it's hard because of three things. First is, what is at stake? Second, the lessons of history. And third, our settled legislative policy and community values as they have evolved over time. I'm quite sensitive to the role of judges in a democracy, but I don't think it's more democratic to defer to the 1964 Congress than to the current Congress, right? The current Congress was elected also. Um, I know law professors mostly disagree with that statement. Mostly they say we should look at the intent of the legislature to pass the law or just the text. But I think the views of the current legislature should be taken into account, especially when history has changed and other statutes have been passed that give us some sense of settled values and our legal tradition. I have a second example. This comes from a mixture of common law and state statutes. I talk about federal law in my property law course a bit, but I spend most of my time thinking about common law and state statutes. Um, I'm first and foremost a state law guy. So... Many states, including Illinois, issued rulings that said landlords have an obligation to comply with the housing code in rental housing, and that if they don't, in a way that affects habitability, then tenants are free to move out before the end of the lease term or stay and stop paying rent until the problem is fixed. 
Those were judicial rulings. Many states, many state legislatures liked those rulings, and they passed statutes codifying them. Many, many, many states took those common law rulings and changed their statutes. Yes, that's a good idea. Courts and legislatures in the states work together. I think they teach each other things. I think it's incredibly fruitful the way state courts and state legislatures teach each other about problems that they had not thought about. Today, the problem we face is that most tenants don't have lawyers. If tenants have lawyers, they know that they cannot be evicted if they have asked the landlord to fix the premises and nothing was done. The tenants can raise the defense at trial. But most tenants don't have a lawyer. They don't know their legal rights. They don't raise the defense. The law gives them the right to stay in their homes, but the judge is a victim anyway. If we look at my prior discussion, let's ask, what's at stake? What does history teach us? And what does our legal tradition say about this? And I'm using legal tradition quite broadly of all our forms of argument and all the sources of law that we look to. What is at stake is the fact that the states are removing people from their homes when they have a legal right to remain there. I teach property law. Those are property rights. The courts are depriving tenants of their property rights. Why are they doing it? They're doing it because the landlord knows about the implied warranty of habitability. The landlord's lawyer knows about the implied warranty of habitability. The judge knows about the implied warranty of habitability. The only person who doesn't know is the tenant. The law gives the tenant the right to remain in her home, and yet the courts are routinely depriving tenants of the right to remain in the home. Evicting someone may make them homeless. We're talking about the property rights of tenants, and we're talking about the rule of law. There's an issue about whether there's due process of law when everyone knows the legal rights of the tenant except for the tenant. What does history teach us? History teaches us that the courts listened to the legislatures and the legislatures listened to the courts. The legislatures passed housing codes that gave tenants rights to heat and hot water. So when you sign a lease, what you're getting is not just a right to be present and not be a trespasser. You're getting the right to heat and hot water. You own that right, right? Um, I use old-fashioned terminology. Um, people that teach property law use old-fashioned terminology. And you own a leasehold. You own a term of years. The tenant is a property owner. The housing codes regulated the residential tenancy business. They gave tenants property rights in habitable housing. Those rights were what the tenants were paying for. So the judges said, if the legislatures gave those rights to tenants then the tenants should get what they're paying for. And that means not having to pay for something you're not getting. That's why the implied warranty of habitability was created. Here in Illinois, I believe the case that created it was in 1972, Jack Spring versus Little. That case placed the burden on tenants to raise the defense in an action for possession or back rent. The appellate division extended the ruling in 1977 in Gerald v. Hartman by giving tenants the right to bring an independent claim against the landlord to vindicate rights when there's a violation of the implied warranty. So the legislature created legal rights, and the courts modernized the common law to be coherent with current statutes rather than coherent with an age where we didn't have those statutes. The statutes redefined property rights, and the court said, well, let's redefine the rights of tenants to be consistent with those policies rather than ignoring the legislature. Um, 
The problem is that the tenants can only benefit from their rights under state law if they affirmatively assert them. If they have no lawyer and they don't know what the law is and they do not speak up at the appropriate time and in the appropriate way, then it is as if those laws were never passed. We're back in the 19th century. The law changed, but oops, the law didn't change. When you evict tenants in those circumstances, you are applying rules that both the courts and the legislatures have rejected. I think that's a problem. So this is my what's at stake here. Again, it's property rights and the rule of law and deference to legislatures, right? I came up with an idea. I don't know if this is a good idea or a kooky one, but my idea was to reverse the burden of persuasion. Right now, the tenant has to raise the defense of the implied warranty of habitability. <clears throat> what if we place the burden on landlords? I came up with this idea, and I thought it was you know, a weird idea. And there I am at music camp. I play violin and viola, and I go play chamber music every summer. Um, and one of the other people at the camp is a clinician at... Um, Temple University Law School in Philadelphia. And he tells me Philadelphia does something like that. In Philadelphia, if you want to be a landlord, you need, a, you need to register and get a permit to be a residential landlord. To be a landlord, you have to prove that your housing is up to code. And then if you want to evict someone, you've got to prove, you've got to show your certificate of suitability in order to evict someone. Now, that doesn't go as far as I think I'd like because I think you should have to get a new one at the time of eviction. The fact that it was okay at the beginning of the lease doesn't mean it's okay now. Um, but it's, that's my idea, and it's actually someone's doing it, right? Maybe it's not so crazy. Um, so I'm wondering whether judges in other states could achieve the same result by telling landlords, if you want to evict someone you don't have the right to take the property back from them unless you're in compliance with the housing code. They have the legal right to stay there if you're violating the housing code. So for you to get possession, you need to prove that you're in compliance with the housing code. Lots of considerations to take into account here. The expense of this. Could you get inspectors to come out? Are there enough inspectors? Um, a lot of objections that you could make. But there's also objections to the current system. Um, and I think this is something that I would want to have a long um, conversation about to figure out, you know, why would this be worse than our current system? It would be worse for landlords. Maybe it would be worse for tenants in certain respects. But it would be better for tenants in certain respects. And it would give an incentive to landlords to comply with the law. And it would have the courts protecting people's property rights and correcting a problem with due process. I started with an easy case. A tenant who doesn't raise a defense can be evicted. I turned it into a hard case in my mind by focusing on <coughs> excuse me, what's at stake, the lessons of history, and the whole of our legal tradition. How can you tell when a case is hard? I think you do that by what I've just said. You look at what matters about the case. You look at the human beings affected by it. You look at the values that are implicated. And you look at how our law has changed over time. You don't just focus on one little thing. You see the, everything in context. Um, and you open yourself up to human response to the situation, not just give me the rule and I'll follow it. So what do you do when a case is hard? Um, I, I, I don't have a magic wand that I got from Harry Potter that will all of a sudden um, 
give you an answer. When a case is hard, it's hard. I think we should confront that. I think we should admit it. I think it's wrong morally and in terms of the way justice works, in terms of the rule of law, to pretend that a hard case, to pretend that an easy case, that, to pretend that a hard case is an easy one. Hard cases are genuinely hard. They implicate conflicting values um, and they have important consequences that matter. And the article that just Donnelly noted that I wrote about the rule of reason and property law, part of what I argued there is you can't decide a hard case by just applying the rules. First day of law school, remember that? We law professors start by teaching everyone how to distinguish cases, right? So you have a rule. Good for you. You have to figure out the fact situations to which the rule applies. The question is whether the rule extends to this situation or not. You can't just apply the rule because the question is what the rule is. Rules don't determine their own scope. Judges do that. So how do you do this? I think lawyers have incredibly useful techniques um, to talk about normative conflicts. I think good lawyers have incredibly useful models for how to engage in civil discourse about highly divisive issues. Um, and I think it would be actually good if some of our techniques were more, more widely taught and practiced. Um, so what are some of those techniques? The first one is we frame the question. Professor Bob Keaton, taught on my faculty for many years, used to say that he could win any argument if you let him frame the question. Lawyers begin briefs by defining the question presented. That's certiorari. What's the question before the court? Lawyers and judges also frame the case by reciting the facts. And we don't just say facts. We tell a story. Storytelling is one of the best ways that we can identify who's the victim and who's the villain. Just look at what's happening this week. We have different victims and villains being talked about this week. We know how to do this. Part of this is then doing it, but also being thoughtful about what's the right way to frame the story and to frame the question. Second thing we do is talk about the values that are implicated in the decision. We do this all the time. We don't just talk about what parties want. We connect what they want with things that we all value. So I'm sensitive to um, the organizations that are sponsoring this um, talk. Um, and Catholic thinking focuses a lot on ultimate goods, the ultimate goods of life. I think lawyers do the same thing. We talk not just about what people want, but we want things because they lead to final ends. Final ends are things we want for their own sake. And we can identify those. Um, they come partly from our religious heritage. They come partly from social life. They come from our upbringing. <coughs> and they come from the legal system. <coughs> we have names like liberty, equality, democracy, respect, humanity. Our society is committed to these values and we're engaged in a long and fruitful struggle to understand what they mean, both in general and in particular cases. 
the adversary system is a good thing in my mind because done well, it helps judges identify values and it unearths the best arguments on both sides about how those values are implicated in the hard case that's before the court. Third, we use context. A rule that worked in 1810 maybe doesn't work today. Um, what we thought about racial segregation in 1789 is not what we think about it today or what we think should think about it today. But context also means social context. When you invite people to your house for dinner, you're allowed complete discretion. You can invite whoever you want, and you don't have to invite people you don't want to invite. But when you operate a store, one thing you're not allowed to do is to choose your customers based on their race. Stores are not homes. Right? Um, uh, we do this all the time in terms of distinguishing cases. We de- determine the social context within which one value trumps another. In the home, the interest in privacy and associational freedom freedom of religion, intimacy, those values prevail over equality norms. In the public accommodation, equality prevails. And the equality that prevails is the interest of the customer in being served. That's where we've come to. Third thing we do is, um, that was the third thing. Fourth thing is everything else. Um, we make priorities among competing values. We, the main thing I think we do is give reasons. Writing opinion really makes a difference. Having to give reasons makes a difference. For many years, I taught a course where I, had, I picked 12 cases being decided by the Supreme Court. And I had 12 students in the class. And they pretended they were the Supreme Court. And I had them meet in conference and vote. And then I'd sign one person to write a proposed majority opinion. That opinion would be circulated, and we would vote again. Every time I taught the course, I taught it for 25 years. Every time I taught the course, at least two of the 12 students changed their minds when they were writing the opinion. The last time I taught it, six of them changed their minds. Now, I'm not exactly sure why, but I can tell you what I think. What I think trains their minds is that I'm sitting there taking notes, and I know what everyone has said. (laughs) And it's one of my criteria to grade them that they have listened to the arguments on the other side, and they say characterize them in a way that are not a caricature and they respond to them and if they cannot respond to the argument on the other side that's what gets them to change their minds the process of having to give reasons to the losing side is what changed their minds I think that disciplines judges much more than telling them to follow the rules By just my observation of our legal system, I don't think rules constrain judges that much. I think rules constrain judges when they're easy cases. But when it's a hard case, the whole reason it's a hard case is that the question is what the rule is. Having to give reasons is, I think, the biggest constraint and check on judges. I think that also is a version of the golden rule because you're trying to figure out if you didn't know which side of the lawsuit you were on, could you think the result was fair? I think the other thing we do is what John Rawls called reflective equilibrium. We reason from the top down and from the bottom up. When we do top-down reasoning, we focus on values, principles, and rules. And then we ask what they mean for specific fact situations. When we reason from the bottom up, we think of the fact situations that we're sure about. 
When the facts are like this, the answer is yes. When the facts are like this, the answer is no. Our case is this one in the middle where we're torn. But if you hold to some cases that you know the answer to, and you try and figure out what rules and principles justify those results, sometimes one of the cases looks hard to you, and you say, well, let's put it on this side of the line. Well, if you do that, you have to change the rule. So sometimes we look at the particular fact situations that we're confident about, and then we go up and change the rules. The idea of a reflective equilibrium is you go back and forth until the rules and principles fit the cases, or the cases fit the rules. And it's never going to be perfect. So Aristotle you know, says you can only expect the amount of certainty that you can expect. Um, I think relig- religious leaders say the same thing. We have to be humble about our ability actually to um, understand things perfectly. And you do the best you can. That's how judges write opinions. Um, and I think trying to make things fit requires trying to be consistent, trying to explain if you are doing something different, can you give a reason for why it's different? And we're not going to have a simple theory that explains everything. Simple theories are just not complicated enough. Human beings are complicated. And justice and morality and the rule of law are complicated. And I'm sorry to say being a judge is complicated. I think what judges should do in hard cases is to make judgments about why certain values prevail over other values, in particular social context. They do this by understanding the meaning of the situation, the events that led up to it, the relations among the parties, the contours of our way of life, and the materials of our legal tradition. The goal of judging in a democracy is to show respect for all persons affected by the dispute. We do that by considered judgment and by trying to give reasons that could be accepted by both sides. I clerked for Justice Morris Pashman on the Supreme Court of New Jersey his last year on the court. He was a great man and a superb judge. He taught me that there were several audiences for every opinion. So this is the state Supreme Court level. The first audience was the lower court judges. He said they should know what we want them to do. So we had to write the opinion clearly enough so that they would have guidance. But he also wanted the trial judges to exercise judgment. He didn't want us to write the opinion so rigidly that the trial judges wouldn't have the feeling that they could figure out what were the values underlying the rule and understand when a hard case came that the Supreme Court wanted them to think and not just apply the rule. Second audience, he said, was the reporters at the Newark Star-Ledger. He thought the public should be able to read Supreme Court opinions and understand them including non-lawyers. And he was insistent that even though we were using technical language, that anyone should be able to understand the opinion. He wanted them to get it right. They usually got it wrong. They would report the case means X, and it meant nothing like what they said it meant. But third, and most important to him, the audience for the opinion was the losing side. He wanted us to show the losing side that we listened to them. We took their arguments seriously. We understood their arguments. We understood what they were asking for, and we understood why they were asking for it. He wanted us to give reasons that they could accept, even if they wouldn't accept them. We had to show how we understood their values 
and how those were related to common values that the court and the other side shared. And we sometimes had to explain to them that we were basing the decision on common values that they had not raised or maybe not seen. Judges, I think, have the responsibility to engage in judgment. So I want to end with just two things. The first is, um, there's a New Yorker cartoon I used to have on my door. It shows a board meeting, all men, and there's a guy who's the head of the table, the CEO, and he's laughing. And he says, I was about to say, don't blame me, I don't make the rules, but then I do make the rules. I think judges make the rules. Um, I have a friend named Johan van der Waalt who's from South Africa who is teaching now at the University of Luxembourg married to a German woman living in France. He said, the notion of responding to a responsibility confronts us with a paradox It clearly involves an element of choice, but it also involves a complete absence of choice. He meant that responding is not the act with someone who's free to do whatever they want, but neither is it simply doing what you're told. To be responsible, he said, is a mode of existence that cannot be reduced to either the passive or the active voice. I think judges are called that for a reason. They exercise judgments. Let's hope their judgments are wise ones. So I, I mean, here's my way of looking at this. Um, uh, I don't want to um, ignore facts about partisan divides. Um, we're obviously divided in a lot of ways. But I think part of our problem is that we have a lot of common values and almost everyone is simply refusing to recognize that. I, you know, when I say, when you think about the basic values, liberty, equality, dignity, humanity, justice, um, we actually all agree about those. I mean, there are a few people that don't. There are a few people that don't want democracy. Um, but everybody wants liberty. Everybody wants to be free to do what they want, and everyone wants law to protect them from harm. So I, I think we have actually a lot of agreement on a lot of things. If you focus on the things that we agree upon, there's actually quite a lot of them. So I, again, I don't want to be Pollyanna-ish and not recognize the situation we're in, but I think part of the reason we're being so partisan is that there's a tendency to not do what good lawyers do. Good lawyers don't make one-sided arguments. If there's one sentence I teach my students, it's that sentence. When you make an argument for the plaintiff, you don't just say, but I really want to do whatever I want. I don't want the government to tell me what to do. If the other side is saying, but your actions are harming me, you can't say, so what? You have to recognize that your actions are causing harm as the other side sees it and then give a reason why that's not a harm the legal system should protect that person from. The one thing you can't do is pretend that there's no harm. And I think a lot of the partisan arguments these days are um, bad arguments. They're actually not using the best of what lawyers know how to do. So, and again, when I teach my first year students about how to write a brief, my view is that a good brief is a proposed judicial opinion. 
It's not, look at me, look at me, look at me. I have interests. Give me what I want. That's the morality of a two-year-old. Right? What we want is the plaintiff to say, my rule is fair to both sides because my rule will have, yes, he's right. My rule has bad consequences. But their rule has bad consequences too. And on balance, my rule is better for everyone and fairer for these reasons. I think lawyers know how to do this. I think judges know how to do this. I think our partisan rancor is partly because politicians have lost the will or the interest in doing that. Um, and I think you know the media, in some respects, has done the same thing. Yes and no. I mean, um, there is a difference because, you know, what I teach my students about constitutional law is that um, it's not very important. Um, the Constitution is like a floor that says, don't torture people. It's like, you know, there, there's like our constitutional rights are basic protections that say, don't be horrible. And we're going to have a democracy, you know, so there's basic rules about basic stuff. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, focus on that basic stuff because it is about our ultimate values, things that just shouldn't happen um, and things that should happen. Um, but 99% of the law is not constitutional law. So I think of constitutional law as here's all the things that absolutely you shouldn't do. And here's the basic structure of a democracy. Um, beyond that, legislatures do your thing. Courts do your thing. So, um, so that's quite different because it's, you know, a lot of my students, if they're making an argument about fairness, they want to make it, well, it must be a constitutional right. And my response, it doesn't have to be a constitutional right to be an important right. I think that's not the right way to understand constitutions. Constitutions take discretion away from lawmakers and judges. I don't think we want to do that unless it's about things we're really sure about. So I think the level of certainty about this is outrageous has to be much higher for constitutional interpretation than statutory interpretation. Part of my argument about the public accommodation law is that Congress can overrule you, right? So I, part of my argument is, you know, which do you want to burden Congress one way or the other? Because you are burdening them whichever way you go. Constitutional, law, I think, is, it can't be cavalier like that. So I think they're quite different. On the other hand, I could apply everything I said to constitutional adjudication. I think it's about values. I think it's about the whole of our legal tradition. I think understanding how we've changed over history, understanding what is at stake, um, I think all of those things are helpful. And I think understanding how the values that are implicated in the decision, um, being honest about them, and here's what they are, um, and especially, I think, being humble and recognizing that there are competing values almost all the time. You don't reach the Supreme Court of the United States unless there's arguments on both sides that are not crazy. It's just, you know, and even if I disagree completely with one side's argument in the Supreme Court, the fact that it's there means someone other than me takes that argument seriously, which means I should. If I didn't think I should, then it turns out I was wrong about that. That's an empirical proof that I should take into account that argument more than I did before. I still may think it's wrong, and I can explain why. But if, it's, if people take it that seriously, I actually should think about whether I should be convinced. So, I, so in that sense, I think everything I said is actually still helpful in that situation.
Well, there's downsides to everything, right? So there's downsides to not doing that. Um, so that, I mean, that's you know, um, you know, the downside is it gives you more to have to think about. Um, I personally actually react whenever someone says, "Think about this." Also, my personal reaction is that's a good thing, not a bad thing. So, um, you know, in general, in academic departments at universities, law schools included, and also among judges, there are people that are simplifiers. And I don't mean simplistic, I mean simplifiers, that there's a reigning theory. Look at the text. My dean, John Manning, look at the text of the statute. That's all you need to do. He has very good arguments for why that's a good idea. I really respect him, and he's incredibly sophisticated about his reasons and about his techniques, right? And looking at just one thing, there's a lot of virtue to that. Um, I just don't see the world that way. I'm a complexifier. That look at one thing makes me incredibly nervous. And part of it has to do with, I just don't think I'm smart enough to look at one thing. And when I look around, I don't think other people look at only one thing. When I just look at what lawyers and judges do in thinking about issues and how I think about them, I just think things are complicated. And I think it's better to really understand the issue in detail rather than to just focus on one thing. On the question about you know how do you figure out current views, um, I don't think it's easy to just read the text and think about nothing else. You know, read the text. Don't think about the fact that people were driving to the South and couldn't get something to eat for five hours. Don't think about it. Just look at the text. You know, to me, that's... um, I find myself thinking about it. If you read history books or... So, you know, I'm looking around seeing the age of people here. A lot of us remember segregation, right? I remember it. This is not ancient Egypt, right? Um, I have friends that, you know, made accommodations for what they had to do when they were traveling. So I, I, you know, the idea that, you know, don't look at anything else I'm not sure that the human mind is actually capable of not looking at other things. I think those things are there. And it's better if we're more honest about it. Um, And then looking at the current legislature, the only, you know, when you ask about how to do that, my example is the best answer I can give you. Um, I don't think I can give you a sentence that says, here's the principle. The example I gave you was, what was life like in 1964? What's it like today? How did the laws change? 46 states, five, you know, 46 jurisdictions, including D.C., five don't. You noticed where they are. Is it a complete accident that it's, you know, Texas, Mississippi, Georgia? It's not an accident that those are the states that don't have these laws. Um, and then you look at other statutes. I think you know that example was meant to give a factual context for to try to explain why I'm pretty confident that the current legislature would think that it was more consistent with what they think the law is and should be to say that it's not okay to make someone stand at the back of the line just because of their race or not let them try on a shirt, or insult them as you you, um, follow them around the store. I've done legal research about this. There are dozens and dozens of cases, and those are just cases that reached the appellate federal courts about horrible treatment in retail stores of people because of their race. This is not a thing of the past. And so um, my story was meant to give some kind of, I couldn't prove it, but I was giving a sense of why I think 
I think I have some idea about what the current legislature might think about this and how that factors in to my idea about the right thing for a judge to do. And our time has expired, uh, but I want you to thank uh, Professor for his talk and also uh, look at the back of your program for the